So I really enjoyed the, the introduction uh, talk of James and uh, this uh, broad, broad definition of, uh, of our research effort of uh, controlling macroscopic properties through selective manipulation of some uh, low energy degrees of freedom, uh, something that I uh, really subscribe to. And today I would like to emphasize uh, the role of orbital degrees of freedom that can have in, uh, in, our, uh, in our systems with a particular emphasis on uh, surfaces and interfaces of complex oxides where these, uh, uh, these uh, degrees of freedom can become really relevant. Uh, so I would like to develop two uh, topics. So in the first part of the talk, I would like to discuss how by manipulating the hybridization between orbitals at interfaces, we can, we can define uh, some very low symmetry environments in which electrons experience uh, geometric effects and this leads to interesting transport phenomena. And in the second part of the talk, I would like to emphasize how we can uh, couple light to orbital degrees of freedom and generate uh, interesting out of equilibrium properties. That's a little bit the gist. And for the first part of the talk, uh, I will dis be discussing the PhD work of uh, uh, Thierry Fantil and Ildi Saglam and Ulderico Filippozzi, which is working now on this project, and then the, the postdoc work uh, of Edouard Len. And I should acknowledge the great theoretical collaboration with the groups of Mario Cuoco and Carmine Ortix in uh, Utrecht and Salerno, and the funding from the ERC uh, and the, the Moore Foundation for, this, for these projects. All right, so when we are dealing um, with condensed matter systems that have either very low crystal symmetry or time reversal symmetry breaking, uh, we have to worry about a quantity called the uh, geometric uh, the quantum geometric tensor, whose imaginary part is a field in momentum space called the Barry curvature, which behaves as, a, as an effective magnetic field. And the presence of this object has a number of consequences for transport and optical uh, phenomena. In particular, I would like to stress the acquisition of uh, anomalous velocity of, uh, uh, during the evolution of, uh, of uh, wave packets in, in momentum space. And this is in principle interesting because it would allow us to uh, control the dynamics of charges and orbitals through some purely quantum mechanical effects. So stuff that go beyond the Lorentz force induced uh, phenomena of, of classical physics. And this in principle can, can allow us to um, engineer some electrodynamics that can be important at terahertz frequencies, including possibly nonlinear responses. So that's, uh, that's why we came into this, uh, this topic. Um, so, what to look in condensed matter for this type of phenomena? Well, we know that uh, Barry phases are strictly zero for real wave functions, so we want to deal with systems that have a, an imaginary representation of the, of the wave functions. Uh, for 2D systems, we want to have something that goes beyond uh, planar spin textures. So Barry curvature distributions are strictly zero if we have a spin texture confined on a 2D plane. And the third ingredient would be having some uh, avoided band crossings between, between various bands which normally leads to an enhancement of, this, of these fields. So we want to look at uh, some quantum superposition at, at a finite crystal momentum of, of some, uh, some different bands. And so the community has been very successful in looking at this type of physics uh, at, at the K points, for example, of gap, gap graphene. So here we are dealing with, uh, with the superposition of uh, a sublattice uh, space. Or another example are vile semimetals where here we have a superposition of a, of a, of a spin space. Um, common to these, to these systems is the fact that you know, we are far away from, from the gamma point, and more importantly, here we are uh, we're look, we're looking at a superposition, a finite crystal momentum of a single quantum number, right? either a sublattice or a, or a spin space. Um, and what we wanted to look at is the possibility of looking at more complex materials in which we can engineer some superposition of uh, orbital uh, states at finite crystal momentum with uh, multiple quantum numbers. So spin and orbitals uh, at the same time being, being in, a, in some uh, entanglement. And this in principle could uh, allow us to explore an interplay between correlated and topological physics. And we think we found a system that has these properties, which is the interface between lanternum illuminate and strontium titanate synthesized along the 111 direction. So we, uh, we're all familiar with the work of, of Harold and is the seminal discovery of a two-dimensional electron gas at the 001 surface of a lanternum illuminate, uh, strontium tantalate with interface with lanternum illuminate. Here we've been looking at uh, 
a system with a slightly different crystalline symmetry, so along the 111 direction. And here we find both spin sources of body curvature and orbital sources that coexist. And we can independently probe uh, the, the two sources by either looking at linear uh, transport in magnetic field or nonlinear transport at zero magnetic field. Uh, and that's uh, what I will uh, show you today. So why looking at the 111 uh, surface of strontium titanate? So if you look at this uh, crystal from, from this direction, um, the, the battery is dead here for the, for the light. Is it possible to have uh, another light? All right, so uh, in the meantime, I will point out. So uh, along the one by one direction, we find ourselves with an hexagonal uh, crystal symmetry. So there is this, uh, this staggered um, Yeah. You meant the pointer, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. but... Um, you just need to be aware that your finger is not in front. I see, sir. All right, thanks a lot. So when we are dealing with this, with this, with this hexagonal symmetry, um, in the presence of spinorbic coupling, the Fermi surface will undergo a trigonal warping. So that's something that we discussed already in 2019. So if we, if we consider a single band in this, in this system under the, the trigonal crystal field and in the presence of spin orbit coupling, um, we, will, we will see that uh, around the gamma point, uh, uh, there's a spin splitting of the Fermi surface, but in addition, there's uh, the acquisition of this, uh, of this hexagonal, hexagonal symmetry. This is quite interesting from the point of view of uh, battery curvature effects because this leads to a mixing term that explicitly invokes the, the sigma z uh, direction. Uh, so as a result, uh, the, the spin texture of this uh, unconventional Rashba system acquires an outer plane uh, component. So instead of, uh, of having a two-dimensional structure here, we have the spins that, that come out of, of the two-dimensional plane and define this, uh, uh, these structures are called Maron's and anti anti-Maron wedges. Um, so we're not the first ones to, to realize this already in 2018, uh, through transport experiments, it was pointed out that the 111 surface of strontium titanate acquires this uh, outer plane uh, spin texture. And the same phenomenology was also observed for the 111 surface of potassium tantalate. What is a little bit new here is that we uh, uh, realized that there is a strong distribution of body curvature that, that comes out in, in this condition in, in momentum space. So the body curvature is non-zero in this uh, annulus region between the two Fermi lines of this, of this pin-split uh, Fermi surface. So obviously, uh, this is a system that is time reversal symmetric, so the, the integral over the whole Brillouin zone of the body curvature should be zero. But uh, nonetheless, locally, you have a distribution of, of body curvature in momentum space. And I would like you to, to notice that this distribution does not, um, is not characterized by any dipoles. So if you imagine any dipolar distribution here, this will be compensated by, by, by some, some opposite uh, dipoles. However, um, if you take this system and we apply an in-plane magnetic field, then things uh, dramatically change. So in the presence of an in-plane magnetic field, now the Zeeman coupling will cause this band to cross each other. And around these crossing points, we're going to have very sharp sources of very curvature and now do not average out to zero. So we have broken time reversal symmetry, and now we have this very strong source of body curvature that have a purely spin uh, origin. So these are due to spin orbit coupling that are mixing uh, the, the, the bands at finite crystal moment. So the, the prediction is that if we apply a magnetic field in plane above a certain characteristic field, we will start developing these so-called hot spots of body curvature and a uh, whole response will, will, will emerge. Um, and this is our experimental observation. So these are, this is a whole response measured as a function of an in-plane magnetic field. And now uh, we are measuring this with a magnetic field oriented parallel to the current direction. So in principle in the system there is zero Lorentz force. Everything that we're looking at here is, is due to, to uh, this type of uh, uh, geometric effect. And what yield this is measuring here is that above a characteristic field, uh, this uh, um, anomalous whole response uh, pops out. And the field at which this anomalous response 
uh, emerges uh, depends on the position of the chemical potential in the system. So we need to have the, the chemical potential. So by moving the gate voltage, we, we can shift it. And, uh, and we observe this, this type of anomalous response uh, that has a non-monotonic uh, non dependence on uh, the position of the chemical potential if you want the, the gate voltage in the, in the system. So we need to be in this sweet spot uh, in, the, in the band structure in which we have an, a, a void level crossing between, between the, the two spin orbit split bands. All right, so this, is, this has to do with the um, superposition of, of spin quantum numbers. What, what about uh, the orbital degrees of freedom? And uh, more importantly, is there any effects related to that that can be detectable at B equals zero? So in, in time reversal symmetric uh, uh, conditions. Um, so in order to look at this, we need to uh, think a little bit about the structural phase transition that are present since Tronsum Titanet, which are a little bit uh, complex. And let me, let me walk you through that. So when we are sitting at, at the 111 surface of Tronsum Titanet, uh, we have uh, this trigon crystal field that I emphasized before. So we, this is characterized by three mirror lines and a C3V uh, symmetry. Uh, when we go across uh, 110 Kelvin, strontium titanate in the bulk undergoes a, a tetragonal distortion. Um, so as a result, we have an, an elongation of one of the, of the axes, and these three mirror lines are not equivalent anymore. So we are, we are left with, uh, with, with, one, with one mirror line. So this, this condition, is, uh, can be captured by, by describing orbital hybridization through a tetragonal distortion that acts at the gamma point and a tetragonal distortion that acts at a finite moment. Additionally, the LAO-STO interface is well known for having an additional transition at 40 Kelvin in which a polar order emerges. So we have an interfacial breaking of inversion symmetry with a polar axis, and this is characteristic of uh, a mixing of the orbitals which is described by a Hamiltonian called the uh, orbital Rashba Hamiltonian, which formally looks like the Rashba spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian, but it's only invoking orbital degrees of freedom. So this is uh, the, the full uh, Hamiltonian with this orbital Rashba term that I, that I just illustrated and the other two uh, due to the tetragonal distortion 105 Kelvin and the trigonal crystal field that is present already at, uh, at room temperature. And here we are describing the T2G orbital manifold using an L equal one uh, approximation. So, this, so here the orbital degrees of freedom are described by the, by the uh, uh, Gelman matrices. So these are, this is a three by three uh, space uh, as opposed to the uh, Pauli matrices that, that we discussed before for the, for, for the spin degrees of freedom. So here we are dealing with a bigger space which is intrinsically richer. And you know, what is really, I think, remarkable that comes out in this system is that uh, the uh, Barry curvature distribution that can be calculated uh, out of this Hamiltonian has a very strong dipolar distribution. So mm -hmm. this is the uh, Barry curvature due, uh, due to the lower uh, line uh, in A1G uh, state. And this is uh, the Barry curvature distribution from the EG prime states uh, at higher energy. And you see that uh, you know, without doing any calculation, you see immediately that the Barry curvature here is, is distributed with a very strong uh, the dipolar uh, shape. Uh, additionally, the uh, EG prime states, they display these very interesting uh, pinch points. So these are known mathematically as, as pinch points, where locally the Barry curvature distribution has a D wave uh, D distribution. So these hot spots and singular pinch points all contribute to defining a, a Barry curvature dipole that, that comes out in this, in this system. And as a result, we should expect nonlinear transport responses. So that's a characteristic of uh, nonlinear uh, yeah, um, transport. And um, so from, from theory, we can, we can calculate a figure of, of merit for, for this effect. And the prediction is that uh, this orbital mixing should lead to Barry curvature dipoles that are as large as, ten, as tens of nanometers. So I, I remind you of uh, maybe uh, the um, um, theoretical prediction of Soderman and Fu uh, from 2015 and the original experiments from the MIT group from 2019, where, where a barrier curvature dipole was measured for the first time in tanks and telluride. And here in these systems, uh, we have a uh, sigma type of uh, mixing of the, of, the, of the bands and dipoles that are of the order of, of a few nanometers. So in, uh, in LAOSTO, um, 
the, the dipole that, that are, are observed, both theoretically and then measured experimentally, are on the orders of tens of nanometers. Right, so what type of uh, transport responses do, do, do we see? Uh, so now uh, we are sitting at uh, B equals zero, so the system is in time reversal symmetric conditions. And here we are looking at the whole response uh, um, generated by a current that is oscillated at frequency omega, and we measure a whole response at frequency two omega. Okay, so a second, a second harmonic uh, uh, response. And you see that we observe a, a large signal that depends on the square of the intensity of the, of the current that we, that, that we are injecting. So this uh, strictly at, at B equals zero. Okay, so from, from this type of measurement, we, we can uh, extract this figure of merit. So a, uh, uh, an inverse of a length in, mo in momentum space is a length. So, uh, so this is something that is in the, in the nanometer range. And uh, we measure something of the order of 75 nanometer depending on gate voltage, uh, which again displays a non-monotonic behavior. So if you look at, at, at the literature, uh, um, the system is uh, the largest, uh, shows the largest uh, barrier curvature dipole measured uh, to date. Um, and we believe that the origin of, of this is the fact that this is the first time they were looking at a barrier curvature dipole coming from orbital effects, which you know, intrinsically uh, result in complex dis distribution of uh, barrier curvature in momentum space with a, with a dipolar shape. Right, so this concludes the first part. I don't know if there are any questions that I could take. At this point, please start. A comment, Jerry, could you make on uh, whether domain structure in the, uh, the bottom part would be, is this a, a net imbalance compensated uh, statement? Right, so the, what I discussed here is, is for a monodomain mm -hmm. co configuration, and we'd be measuring samples that have dimensions in which a few domains are present. Mm -hmm. So we are not averaging over a very large number of, of them. There's only, there's only a few. So the model is strictly for a, for a single domain structure. So we are currently uh, studying the problem at a local level, uh, collaborating with, with BINA, um, and hopefully we will be able also to address the, the role of, of domains. Thank you. Yeah. But I think it's important, especially with regards to the polar phase. So the, this polar phase uh, obviously has a strong pinning depending on, on the domains, so that, that will definitely play a role. Okay, perfect. Then, uh, how, how much time do I have left? You have about six to seven minutes. Perfect, perfect, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so in the second part of the talk, I would like to emphasize a little bit uh, out of equilibrium uh, aspects. Um, uh, I will, I'm gonna show you mostly the, the work from the PhD of, uh, of Matthias Matissen, uh, which is present, uh, that is present here, and, and fr um, from Yoritor Hortensius, also that, that finishes his PhD about, about a year ago. And I should acknowledge the theoretical collaboration with uh, Boris Ivanov uh, and, and Roberta Citro, in particular for this, for this project. Um, and so here we, we want to uh, use uh, selective excitation of orbital degrees of freedom to investigate whether it is possible to, to excite spin waves and uh, possibly even propagating spin waves in antiferromagnets. And uh, the first system that I would like to highlight is a uh, manganese thiophosphate. So this is a very interesting antiferromagnet to study optically because it's characterized by a breaking of inversion symmetry in the antiferromagnetic phase. So this leads to a strong second harmonic response uh, below the nail temperature. So when you go below 75 Kelvin, there's a, a large second harmonic signal that you, that you can directly probe. Uh, and this is a, a measure of the, of the antiferromagnetic order in, in the system. And uh, so Matthias has been investigating and comparing what happens in this system when you excite phonons and when you excite orbital degrees of freedom. And, and there is a characteristic aspect of this antiferromagnet that, that we wanted to, to investigate is the fact that in the, in the ground state, this is a system which has a, a manganese two plus, which is in an orbital singlet. So here you have a, a five ampere spins. So the, the overall <coughs> system is a spin uh, five half, but the orbital part is strictly zero. So this is a system that in principle at equilibrium has zero spinobic coupling because L, L, L is zero. And what Matthias saw that was quite interesting is that uh, by exciting uh, phonons in this, in this material, this leads trivially to a spin disordering in the material and, and a, a melting of antiferromagnetic order over, over thermal uh, time scales. 
Okay, so we attribute this, this phenomenon to the absence of spinorbic coupling in the system that can mediate a more interesting effect. However, in the, in the same system, you have uh, orbital excitations that are accessible optically. So there is, in particular, at 1.9 electron volt, a, uh, a T41G uh, um, excitation, which uh, creates suddenly uh, the, the presence of a finite angular momentum in, this, in, in, the, in, in the orbital system. All right. So when, when uh, we do this, this experiment uh, optically, we have a, a, suddenly, a sudden coupling of spin and orbital uh, angular momentum, and this is uh, imparting a uh, torque on the, on, on the spin system, and uh, this leads to the, to the appearance of, of large uh, coherent oscillations of the, of the uh, monetization. So if, if you would like to know more about these experiments, please go to Matthias Poster uh, this afternoon and uh, I'll be delighted to, to, tell, to tell you more, more about it. All right, and then I would like to use the final, minute, the fi the final minutes of my talk to discuss the possibility in, in antiferromagnet to excite orbitals to uh, um, generate propagating uh, antiferromagnetic waves. So this is interesting because uh, um, obtaining antiferromagnetic spin transport can in principle lead to a very uh, high speed of propagation of, of angular momentum in, in condensed matter. And in principle, this can be uh, operating at terahertz frequencies with, with macroscopic ballistic uh, pr propagation lengths. Um, um, optically, typically, we are, we are working at Q equals zero. So we, we are not typically imparting uh, momentum to, to our, our excitations. And uh, all the optical experiments done so far on, on antiferromagnet, they uh, entailed a, a uniform antiferromagnetic spin precession modes. So this is something that you know, typically do not lead to, to propagation effects. However, if we choose to excite our, our antiferromagnet with some sharp uh, optical resonance, uh, so typical, typically opt, uh, orbital transitions, uh, we can have uh, a situation in which the optical excitations of the material is confined over a very thin uh, skin depth at the surface of, of the material. So this can be uh, sometimes below the characteristic wavelength of, of excitations of, of spin waves. And, and this naturally can lead to, to, to the generation of, of a magnon wave packet. So how does, how does this work? So the material that we use for this study is this prosium mortiferite. So this is an antiferromagnet that, that is characterized by a first order phase transition from a low temperature collinear antiferromagnetic state to a high temperature uh, weakly ferromagnetic state. And this is a first order phase transition with a competition between two different orders. And the measurement scheme here uh, is, a, is a pump probe experiment in which one pulse comes in that excites uh, orbital degrees of freedom, and then a second probe pulse comes in and picks up uh, either the Faraday or, or the Kerr rotation um, which is a measure of the, of the monetization of the ion 3 plus uh, in, this, in, in this material. And the, the key point that I would like to stress here is that we choose for this experiment to address a, a, a particular orbital absorption line, um, which uh, is characterized by a penetration depth that falls in the tens of nanometer range. So this is well, well below the, the characteristic uh, wavelength of, of uh, spin waves in the system, so in principle, can lead to the generation of a, of a number of, uh, of components of a, of a propagating uh, wave packet in momentum space. And so in, in our experiments, we can actually change the incident wavelength of, the, of, this, of this excitation, and we, we can change uh, the angle at which we, we detect uh, a, car, a car rotation. And, and this allows us to, to map the, the frequency of, of spin waves that, that have been excited. And we see that, that uh, we, can, we can pick up a number of components of a, of a propagating wave packet over a, over a portion of the Brio1 zone, which is the only part that is accessible within, within our experiments. So what, what you see here uh, is not a fit. So these are our experimental data. And the, the gray line is the spin wave dispersion that is known for, for this material. So we, we really believe that we are, we are accessing a certain number of components of a, of a propagating wave packet. And through these measurements, we can estimate the propagation speed of a, of a, of a propagating <coughs> spin wave, which is of the order here uh, of 12 kilometers per second, which is three times the speed of sound and only a factor of two within the limiting speed of, uh, of uh, spin wave packets in, uh, in this particular uh, antiferromagnet. 
so we can also uh, let the spin wave ring for a long time, and this allows us to estimate uh, the, 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 the propagating uh, ballistic length for this wave packet, which is of the order of one micro. So, uh, so, so the final uh, yeah, take home message for, for this is that you know, if we address very sharp uh, optical resonances in, in antiferromagnet, this uh, you know, also creates the, an opportunity to, to generate uh, propagating spin waves, which in principle can be, can be used for, for transport information over, over macro, macroscopic distances or at very fast uh, velocities. All right, um, let me finish the talk by uh, a little bit of self-promotion. Self we have uh, uh, a number of uh, positions that are still open in Geneva where we, we are moving the labs. So if you're interested in this type of uh, stuff, I'd be delighted to discuss projects with you. And uh, let me finish by thanking the, the members of the group and I'll leave you with the references that I, that I discussed today. Thanks.